My name is John Mandrola. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist, heart rhythm uh, doctor in Louisville, Kentucky. Been there for 20 years, my 20th year. I do uh, consultative heart rhythm work um, and I'm interested in uh, atrial fibrillation. One of my interests in cardiac electrophysiology, heart rhythm care, is the influence of lifestyle and how lifestyle can actually be both preventive and also uh, therapeutic for, for patients. And we've undergone an, a, a pretty big transformation in the last five to 10 years in our field. Um, we treat atrial fibrillation, it affects millions of people. It used to be that we thought of atrial fibrillation as its own disease, a heart rhythm disease. It required medicines, uh, procedures. But now the transformation is that we're beginning to understand that atrial fibrillation is actually a sign or manifestation of other kinds of typical cardiac diseases like obesity, poor diet, um, a sleep apnea, alcohol intake, lack of exercise. And the transformation is, is understanding how lifestyle can make a significant impact on both the heart rhythm and the overall health of people. So in medicine, we're taught to find the underlying cause of diseases or conditions. And we treat that underlying cause. And I think the big news in atrial fibrillation care is that in most cases, there are some special cases, but in most cases, there's causes of atrial fib and they're sort of upstream from the atrium. Uh, things that affect atrial health are uh, things that stretch the atrium, like high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, um, uh, and even stress and anxiety. Uh, Over-exercise, for instance, over-endurance exercise. Not typical exercise, but over-exercise. All of these stimuluses or factors can have ill effects on the atrium. When I started uh, medical uh, practice in 1996, 20 years ago, we basically looked for thyroid disease and valvular heart disease. But now uh, that search has been expanded into these other causes like high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, typical metabolic risk factors. And so we, we, we search for those and we talk to patients and look for clues of things that could be causing the AFib. And, and the reason is that if you can correct um, one of those causes, then you can uh, avoid uh, some of the therapies of AFib. And some of the therapies, uh, the drugs and ablation procedures, they have upsides and they have downsides. And if you don't even have to go there, then that's a huge, huge benefit. One of the uh, biggest questions patients ask is, um, what about aspirin? The, the idea being that it's not as potent a blood clot, uh, blood thinner, and maybe it's safer to take. And there's a great debate in cardiology going on right now about the use of aspirin in patients with AFib. And it's really split by the Atlantic Ocean. In, the Europe, in Europe, the European uh, guidelines suggest that aspirin really doesn't work for AFib. It raises the risk of bleeding, but does not reduce the risk of stroke. So the European cardiologists pretty much say you either take a blood clotting drug or you don't take anything. The North American guidelines are a little different and they hold on to the fact that there may be some small benefit of taking aspirin. Um, one, of the six, one of the six major clinical trials that looked at using blood clotting drugs showed some small benefit of aspirin. Um, uh, and North American doctors say, okay, there may be some benefit. Here's the cool thing about risk factor management. If you can get a patient to improve their diet, uh, improve their exercise, um, uh, sleep better, and reduce their weight, then these metabolic risk factors reduce their risk of having a stroke regardless. And so um, th that's what's disruptive about lifestyle treatment in AFib is it just doesn't help the rhythm. It might help reduce the risk of stroke by improving the overall cardiac profile of patients. 
I'm a specialist. I, I, I learn to do cardiac procedures. I do cardiac procedures and they, they have a role. But really, I'm not just a proceduralist. I'm, I'm an, a doctor. I'm charged with helping patients and their overall uh, health. And really, um, helping people with their overall health is more than just doing procedures. It's really helping them with all of the, all of the factors that go into this. And we know we have evidence that if you can help people with diet, exercise, sleep, stress management, you'll, you'll help them in terms of their heart rhythm and you'll help them feel better and, and live longer. And really, that's what being a doctor is all about.